Hey friends, Elizabeth here from Plant-Based Bride, back again with another video. Today I'm excited to share with you all the books I finished in November, my thoughts, feelings about them, my ratings, as well as a couple goodies I got in the mail that I'm hoping to read in December. I'll start with my reading stats as always and then get into speaking about each book individually. Of course, as always, there are chapters in this video, so if you want to skip around and pick and choose what you watch and when, feel free. Before we get into the stats though, I do want to talk to you about today's video sponsor, Ana Luisa. As you'll know, I am an Ana Luisa partner. I have worked with them for years at this point and I am a huge, huge fan of their jewelry. I literally wear their pieces every single day and I am incredibly grateful to work with a company that is so committed to sustainability in their production. Ana Luisa uses recycled gold in their pieces to reduce waste from gold mining and their pieces are absolutely stunning. I'm wearing all of my newest pieces right now and I am absolutely obsessed. The necklace I'm wearing is the Taurus necklace from their Zodiac collection. I'm actually a Taurus moon, but the main reason I got Taurus instead of Leo, which is my sun and rising sign, is my last name, Turnbull, since a bull is the symbol of my Scottish family. It's part of the tale of how our family came to be. I loved this bull design for the Taurus necklace and just knew that I had to have it for my name, for my family history, but also I am a Taurus moon and I relate hard <laughs> to the Taurus life. I also love my new earrings. These big statement hoops are so much fun. I don't typically wear larger hoops, but I feel like at this time of year, the holiday season, something about big gold hoops just feels so perfect. I also love this piece. It is so unique. A tiny little safety pin connected to a little cubic zirconia stud. So cute. And I love any chance to get to wear pieces that can connect through multiple of my piercings. This is the perfect time to try Ana Luisa since they're having their holiday sale and you could pick up something for yourself and something for someone you love. Maybe your best friend or a sibling or a parent. Giving the gift of sustainably made quality jewelry is the kind of gift that anyone would love. Ana Luisa crafts their jewelry in small batches to reduce waste. They also offer eco-friendly packaging with an option to opt out of as much packaging as possible at checkout. The beautiful fabric pouches can be reused for a plethora of things or just to keep your stunning Ana Luisa pieces inside. I have adored working with Ana Luisa this year as I have in past years and I know if you treat yourself or a loved one to Ana Luisa for the holidays, you will not regret it. Right now, until the 10th of December, Ana Luisa is having an amazing holiday sale. 15% off one piece, 20% off two pieces, and 25% off three pieces from the Ana Luisa website. Make sure to use the link in my description box or the pinned comment to shop and give the gift of sustainable jewelry this year. Thank you so much to Ana Luisa for sponsoring this video, and now let's hop into the stats. So I finished seven books in November, which is a little low for me, and I'm definitely a couple books behind on my goal of reading 125 by the end of the year. So in total, I read 2,511 pages in November, and I did have one DNF, which I'll talk about later. As for the age demographic of the books I read, the majority of them were aimed at adults, 71.4%, while 28.6% were young adults. As for genre, most of the books I read were science fiction, three books were sci-fi, two were fantasy, one was a classic, which I would consider a mystery if I had to give it another genre, and one was horror. 42.9% I listened to via audiobook, 42.9% I read in physical form, and 14.3% I read as an ebook. I had pretty good luck when it came to the books I read this month. I liked everything I read. Two of the books I read I had some problems with but generally enjoyed, so they got three stars. One book got four stars and four books got five stars. 57.1% had no rep and 42.9% had LGBTQIA plus rep in some form. As for the year published, two of the books I read were published this year in 2021, two books were published in 2019, and one book was published in 2018, 2016, and 1938, respectively. As for how I got the books I read this month, 57.1% I owned, 
14.3% I got from Libro FM, and 28.6% I borrowed from the library. As for the identity of the authors of the books I read this month, 42.9% were white, 14.3% were East Asian, 14.3% were Latina, and 28.6% were Indigenous. 85.7% were female, and 14.3% were multiple authors of multiple genders, including Two-Spirit and Non-Binary. As for the author's nationality, two were from Canada, my homeland, one was from Ecuador, one was from the United Kingdom, and three were from the United States. And that's it for the stats this month. Very interesting. I always love to look at this as an overview of my reading of the month. It really gives me a good idea of what I am being drawn to and how I'm doing as far as reading diversely. Now moving into talking about the books individually, starting very briefly with the DNF for the month. So as I mentioned, I did have one DNF in November, and that was The Lost Ones by Sheena Kamal. And I got to about 34% of the way through the audiobook on this one before deciding to put it aside. There wasn't anything glaringly wrong with it. You know, I didn't hate it or anything. I just really couldn't connect to the protagonist at all. I didn't feel invested in the story at all. It just wasn't affecting me <laughs> in any way. And I was really struggling to continue to listen to it. I just found I was having trouble paying attention. It wasn't capturing my interest. So I decided to put it aside and maybe at a later date, I'll try it again. Now onto the books that I did actually finish in November. So the first book I finished in November was The Inheritance of Orquida Divina by Zoreda Cordova. And this is a fantasy novel focused on the matriarch of this large family. She was originally from Ecuador and eventually came to the United States, and she's been married several times. She has many, many children and grandchildren, and she's sort of ruled the roost over her family for a long time. But she is reaching the end of her life, and she invites as many of her living family as she can find to come see her one more time. And they discover that their grandmother has been living under a curse for almost her entire life, and they have to unravel the threads to discover what this curse is and to lift their family out from under its burden. This was a really, really touching book and so fantastical and whimsical. I loved how it focused on the importance of family, of familial relationships, and it also touched on greed and how greed is only spurred on by the acute accumulation of more, that you just want more and more and more, that that greed is never quenched. It's also focused on identity and growth and becoming, coming of age, turning into who you were always meant to be. The characters were amazing. They were so varied and complex. I really loved all of the main characters that were really present throughout the entire story, and even many of the minor characters that just popped up here and there felt really fleshed out and had a lot to say. I loved the way we had multiple timelines, these intertwined stories. I felt they were all told really well, and I thought that they were well balanced. You know, you can read books sometimes that have multiple timelines or multiple stories where you feel like too much time is spent on one or the other, or just as you're feeling like you're really getting into one storyline, it switches to the other and it can be kind of frustrating. For me, that did not happen at all in this book. It just felt like everything flowed really perfectly. This book was just so magical and I really loved it. I got so emotional <laughs> a couple times, but especially at the end, it was just beautiful. So if you haven't read this one, please do. You're missing out. The next book I finished in November was Empire of Wild by Sherry DeMaline, and this is a story based on the Métis legend of the Rougarou, which is essentially a descendant of various myths of wolfmen or werewolves. The Rougarou stalks the night, attacking or transforming people who have sinned in one way or another. There were definitely many moments full of tension in this novel, some really spooky moments, and I really loved loved the characters, especially our protagonist and her nephew, Zeus. They were amazing. I loved them. And this was another book that had amazing characters and really focused on those familial relationships. Just beautiful, complex 
connections between people and the kind of characters that jump off the page and just feel incredibly real. It was definitely scary at times. I definitely got spooked listening to this audiobook more than once. And I really loved to read a story that was set in Canada. While the story on its surface is a werewolf story, a spooky story, it does really explore much deeper issues, including racism and colonialism and the role that religion and Christianity specifically has played in the oppression of Indigenous people in Canada and around the world. This is a super fast-paced story that you won't be able to put down with incredibly vivid characters in Joan and Zeus especially, and I loved the ending that was left open for interpretation. If you're looking for something that is spooky but has something deeper to say and characters that you can really, really root for, I would highly recommend Empire of Wild. The next book I finished in November was The Grace Year by Kim Leggett. And this is basically a teenage female version of Lord of the Flies with quite a bit of The Handmaid's Tale sprinkled in for good measure. <laughs> and I really was enjoying this book for the first half or so. It was really interesting. I thought the world building was really well done. It is the style of world building where it's built piece by piece or brick by brick, just little bits added as you go instead of a bunch of exposition just explaining this world to you. And I really do enjoy world building like this where it comes together a little bit here and there, especially because this world is so starkly different from the world we live in now, even though there are quite a few unfortunate fortunate similarities. I was excited for this. I found the concept really interesting. I was enjoying how many strong female characters we were able to follow through the story. And it's very eerie, has quite a chilling quality to it. And I listened to this audiobook in a single day. I was completely hooked and I needed to know what was going to happen. And it definitely had a couple twists and turns here and there. I think it had a lot of interesting things to say about how we treat women, how we use religion as a scapegoat to oppress women, to veil our fear of the power that women hold. This was a very clear conversation about misogyny and sexism and poor treatment of women throughout history. And I found it really interesting how it focused not only on how men can be afraid of women's natural strength and power and use it against them, but also how, especially through religion, men have had a tendency throughout history to turn women into supporters of the patriarchy to the point where they turn on themselves, where women are policing other women, which is also a big theme in Handmaid's Tale, which is, of course, where some of those similarities pop up. It definitely had a lot to give. It was very interesting. I very much enjoyed it, especially that first half, but it had a fatal flaw. And the fatal flaw was shoehorning in a random romance for no reason. <laughs> And let me tell you, when I realized that was what was happening, I did a double take and I was so confused and I kept hoping that the author was going to trick me, that this was a misdirection and it was going to go in a completely different direction than it seemed like it was going to go. But no, just a completely unnecessary romance thrown in there. I don't know why. <laughs> it was definitely the worst part of the book for me. I did not like the love interest at all. And I also really didn't enjoy the double standards where we are given multiple opportunities to feel the disgust of older men forcing young girls and women to marry them and sleep with them and procreate with them. That is a recurring theme. It's a very integral part of the society that we're supposed to recoil from. And then this love interest is a grown man, and there's a sexual relationship with a girl who is a teenager, as in not an adult, and we're supposed to root for it, I guess, and it just felt so hypocritical. There was a huge power imbalance between the love interests that just made it extra icky. It just, from that point on, I, I had a bad taste in my mouth and I was really struggling to get back into the narrative because it just felt like everything had been tainted by this completely unnecessary, have I said it's unnecessary enough? Completely unnecessary romance. So yeah, this book got three stars. It could have potentially been a five-star read if it hadn't had this ridiculous, unnecessary <laughs> romance, but it did. 
it did. So I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. If any of you have read The Grace Here, what did you think of this romance? It just, it was the worst in my personal opinion. I was not happy about it. <laughs> and I still think this book is worth a read. I think everything outside of the romance is fascinating, really thought provoking. And I am interested to see what this author does next, but I just really hope that she leaves out the tropey YA romance from the next one, because this is poignant and important social commentary on gender and patriarchy, religion, sexism, and oppression, and bodily autonomy, and it just, it's so muddied by this weird, weird love story. So yeah, that's the grace here. <laughs> I clearly have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> okay, moving on. So the next book I finished in November was Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. And this is a classic. This was written in 1938 or published in 1938 initially. And I would classify it as a mystery, literary mystery, I suppose. It is gothic fiction and it has all of those delicious gothic vibes, very creepy manner on the edge of the sea, servants who are acting really sketchy, <laughs> an older widower who marries a young woman and brings her to his remote estate. And I loved this. I mean, I expected to like it. I had heard good things about Rebecca. I had been wanting to read it for a very long time and I was pretty sure it would be up my alley, but I thought it was amazing. I mean, <laughs> a lot of classics, even classics I really like, can sometimes be a little bit slower paced than we're used to from reading modern modern fiction. Sometimes things can feel a little drawn out. Sometimes sections can feel boring. I feel like nothing in this book was boring. Every single page was full of tension and intrigue and eeriness. The main character, our protagonist, is unnamed throughout the novel and she is so relatable and I felt so, so bad for her because she's this young woman who is pretty sheltered. She hasn't had very much experience in her life and she's been working as a companion for a wealthy woman. She didn't grow up in society. She didn't have much of her own. And she just gets plucked out of this situation with a proposal by Mr. De Winter, Maxim De Winter, who is this wealthy man, a widower who has lost his wife. And she comes to live with him in this manner, expecting them to have this amazing life together and discovers that the ghost of his late wife, Rebecca, just permeates the entire estate. She is everywhere. Our protagonist can't escape her and she has this internal struggle that is just so fascinating to witness where she both hates Rebecca and loves her in a way admires her, almost wants to be her. There's this level of obsession that is really fascinating while also feeling trapped and oppressed by Rebecca's presence. And it is a mystery. There are twists and turns, shocking reveals. The characters are really interesting. Again, especially that protagonist. I think she was really relatable in her shy awkwardness and just complete lack of ability to fit into Rebecca's shoes. Although she was so earnest in her attempts to. This was a really, really great book. Can you tell that I liked it? Five stars for sure, a new favorite. Everything that I want out of a gothic novel, out of something spooky, but also something that has emotional weight and beautiful descriptions. The descriptions of Manderley itself, of the gardens, of the forest, of the sea were just stunning. It's really good. <laughs> I would highly recommend it. I'm definitely going to be rereading this many times throughout my life, I'm sure. I can't believe I put this off so long, but I'm glad that I finally read it because, damn, Daphne du Maurier knocking it out of the park back in 1938. <laughs> The next book I finished in November was The Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Kowal. And this is the first book in a sci-fi series about lady astronauts. Beginning in 1952, when a meteorite impacts Earth and changes the direction of history. This was our book club selection for this past month. And I finished this book a couple days ago, and I'm still sort of working through my thoughts on this. I think it will help a lot once we've had our book club discussion. And I can chat with the other members of the book club about how we felt because I, I feel so conflicted. I gave it three stars. I think there were a lot of good parts to the book. There were a lot of interesting moments, but I think it very much felt like the first book in a series in that way that unfortunately some first 
installments of series can, feeling like they're just setting up the series, that the book doesn't do much on its own, doesn't really have much of a complete arc, doesn't really grip you as a standalone. It's just here are several hundred pages to get you on track so that book two can really take you off on an adventure. And that's definitely what this felt like. I found myself struggling with the pacing. I felt it was pretty slow. Not a lot happened and we covered a lot of ground, but it just felt like treading water. There was a lot of repetition, quite a few discussions and moments and struggles that just happened over and over and over again. And it didn't feel like there was much progression there, much growth. It just was the same problems repeatedly, which can be pretty frustrating to read. And sadly, I didn't really connect to the protagonist either. I found her kind of insufferable, <laughs> which is unfortunate because she does suffer from a panic disorder. She is struggling with anxiety, which I can relate to. I have struggled with anxiety throughout my life. I've struggled with having panic attacks. And at first I was really excited to read a character like me in that way but I just couldn't connect to her. It felt like she was actively in her own way, in every possible way, every moment of every day. <laughs> and it was really, really frustrating because it's one of those things where I can relate to that, especially with anxiety. It's one of those things where sometimes you can't help but do the thing that is the worst thing you could possibly do for your anxiety in a particular moment and you don't really have a choice. But it was just frustrating to watch her constantly make those same mistakes and constantly put herself in situations that would trigger a panic attack and not take any of the help offered, not help herself. I have complex feelings about it, clearly. <laughs> um, I am curious if any of you have read this book or this series. I don't know how many books have already been released. I know the second one is out already. I don't know if there are more, um, but I'd be curious to know if you've read this first book in the series or multiple books in the series, what your thoughts are on the main character and the series in general, because I just feel a little bit let down, I guess. There wasn't enough to get me excited about this as a series in general. And, you know, the end of this book is supposed to be this really triumphant moment for our main character. And I just didn't really feel anything I also really found the way that she and her husband were written together <laughs> super cringy and uncomfortable. I don't have any problem with reading sex in books, and there was nothing explicit here, but just the dialogue, the way that they got into their sexy times <laughs> throughout this book were just so awkward and cringy and very uncomfortable to read, and also just came up so often. It felt like almost the only interaction we saw between the protagonist and her husband, other than him reminding her about prime numbers and giving her equations to do, was them massaging each other or really weird, awkward, dirty talk <laughs> to lead into sex. And I was just like, I, I don't need this. I'm fine. I'm really fine. So yeah, three stars. <laughs> Three stars, I know. I don't think I've said much positive here. I really enjoyed the discussion of the planes. I enjoyed the discussion of the struggles that the women were facing being taken seriously as anything other than wives or eye candy, um, struggling to be taken seriously even with PhDs and as experienced pilots. I wish we'd explored more of that without it feeling like one note that was repeated over and over again. There was some interesting inclusion of anti-Semitism and racism and how those discriminations tied in with the sexism to cause a lot of the women to be overlooked for advancement within this space program. And I thought that there was potential there and maybe that is explored further in later books of the series. I'm not sure, but it just fell flat for me. Actually, the stakes as well. One more thing. <laughs> not quite done. The stakes felt very low, even though the stakes are literally the survival of the human race, which was kind of strange. But anyway, so that was the calculating stars. I feel many feelings clearly, and uh, I'll continue processing. I'll write my Goodreads review after our book club discussion. And if you're curious to hear if my thoughts have changed <laughs> then you can check me out on Goodreads. The next book I finished in November was Six Crimson Cranes by Elizabeth Lim. And I must admit, I mostly bought this book because it is one of the most beautiful covers I've ever seen. I mean, look at it. <laughs> I saw it in someone's TikTok and I immediately had to find this particular cover. The other cover is also beautiful, but the colors of this one, I just, oh my God. So I waited like two months for it to come from the UK so I could have it because <laughs> I have a problem. But you know what? 
I'm glad I did because this book really, really surpassed my expectations. I hoped I would like it. I hoped it would at least be a three star read to make up for the effort I went through to get this beautiful book in my hands. But it was a five star read and it was amazing. And I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> this is the story of Shiori, who was the princess of Kiata, and she has a magic that she has had to hide. Her stepmother has her own dark magic and curses Shiori and her six brothers. Shiori is banished and transformed so no one will recognize her, and her six brothers are turned into cranes, only able to return to their human form at night. Shiori is also unable to speak. With every word spoken, one of her brothers will die. Shiori is lost and alone, and she must find that power deep inside and harness it to save not only herself and her brothers, but her entire kingdom. And at the beginning of this book, I wasn't really sure how I was going to feel about it. It's definitely written for a slightly younger audience. It's YA, but I would say it kind of comes across as a younger YA, almost approaching middle grade. So the tone at the beginning, I was struggling with a little bit as a definitely not young adult. <laughs> and I was a bit worried that it would kind of fall flat for me because of that disconnect between the intended audience and myself. But about halfway through, things shifted pretty significantly. I started really falling in love with Shiori as a character as well as Kiki. Well, I don't want to give it away, but Kiki is the best character in this book by far. And I freaking love Kiki forever. I wish Kiki were real and were my best friend. But anyway, <laughs> um, Shiori really grew on me. She really came into her own. And and was sassy and resourceful and awesome. And there were also several other characters that were really well developed and really interesting to encounter throughout the book. I also, I guess there's a bit of a theme here with the books I read in November. I hadn't realized until talking about them all now, but one of my favorite parts of this book was the theme of family. Not only her connection to her six brothers and that drive to save them, but also her connection with her stepmother, with her birth mother, and with her father. This family connection. The importance of those familial relationships was very clear in this book and really touching. I definitely sobbed like a little baby <laughs> in the final chapter. I won't give anything away, but there's a really beautiful moment between Shiori and one of her family members, and it just all the feels. The magic is really interesting. There are dragons in this book and demons and curses and nets spun of demon fire and star fire and threads of fate from a goddess. It is so imaginative and really beautifully told. Also quite funny and definitely has a lot of heart. So I would highly recommend this one. I believe this is actually the first in a series as well. I don't know when the rest of the books will come out, but I'll definitely read them. But yeah, I would highly recommend, even for non-young adults like myself, this really, really surprised me. I thought it was absolutely exquisitely done. Just beautiful. And the last book I finished in November is actually an anthology, and that is Love Beyond Body, Space, and Time, which was edited by Hope Nicholson. And this is an Indigenous LGBT sci-fi anthology. So this is an anthology of sci-fi stories, short stories written by Indigenous authors, most of whom are within the LGBTQIA plus community themselves and focused on characters who fall within the community. There is a lot of varied LGBTQIA plus representation in this book, characters who identify in so many different ways. And the stories themselves are very varied in tone and content. I don't think I've ever read an anthology where I've given it five stars just because it tends to be hit and miss. I'll adore some stories and some will kind of fall flat for me. And that was the case here as well. There were some stories that I was just completely in love with and blew me away. There were some stories that I enjoyed but weren't as impactful for me personally. So I felt four stars was a good rating for this collection. I was really excited to read this because I love sci-fi. It's my favorite genre, but sci-fi can be very very white and very straight and often very male. And it's just nice to read sci-fi that isn't so heteronormative. That's why Becky Chambers is one of my favorite sci-fi authors. That's why I love the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. And that's why I really enjoyed reading this series because getting those different perspectives in sci-fi just adds so much to the kinds of stories you can tell. Because there's so much more possibility when it comes to sci-fi than just insert random white straight dude who's gonna save the universe because he has a lot of guns on the spaceship, you know? 
So I would definitely recommend this anthology if you are as into sci-fi as I am. All right, so those are all the books that I read in November. I hope you enjoyed hearing all my thoughts. As always, please let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of the books I talked about. I would love to hear your thoughts, whether you agreed with me or not. Let's discuss. And of course, if you have any recommendations for me, leave them down below. I am always looking for more recommendations, even though my TBR is way too long. It's almost embarrassing. Before I go, I want to show you two books I recently got in the mail that I'm really excited to read. Hopefully I will get to them in December. These were sent to me by Illumicrate, which is an awesome company. You should definitely check out. The owner, Daphne, is just absolutely the best. She is so lovely. And they have several different subscription boxes for book lovers, as well as special edition runs of certain books that are just stunning. For the main Illumicrate subscription box, you can either get the entire box, which comes with a bunch of other specialty items, as many book boxes do, or you can get the book only subscription, which is what these are from. So the first book they sent me was Iron Widow by Zaran J. Zhao, and I am so excited to read this. I I actually knew of the author before I knew about this book. They had created a video about the live action Mulan and it was recommended to me as it was to many people because it went mega viral and I found the video really interesting and I subscribed and I've watched several of their videos since only to discover that they had just published a book and I've been really excited to read this ever since and it was serendipity that Illumicrate decided to send me the book to read. I'm very excited. So this is Iron Widow. I will read the inside of the book jacket for you. You've been living a dream for long enough. Welcome to your nightmare. The boys of Hu Zai dream of the celebrity status that comes with piloting chrysalises, giant transforming robots that battle the aliens beyond the Great Wall. Their female co-pilots are expected to serve as concubines and sacrifice their lives. When 18-year-old Zetian offers herself up as a concubine pilot, her plan is to assassinate the ace male pilot responsible for her sister's death. But on miraculously emerging from the cockpit unscathed after her first battle, she's declared an Iron Widow, the most feared pilot of all. Now that Zetian has had a taste of power, she sets her sights on bigger things. The time has come to stop more girls from being sacrificed. The Handmaid's Tale meets Pacific Rim in this dazzling blend of Chinese history and mecha science fiction. Sounds badass. I am so excited to read this. And this edition is so beautiful. Obviously, the book jacket is beautiful, but can we just look at the edges for a second? I'm sorry. <laughs> Wow. So the book itself inside is black. And then the inside of the book jacket has art as well. Also, I love this. <laughs> the author had mentioned that they promised a friend that if they ever published a book, they would pose for their author photo in a cow onesie. And I have the same cow onesie, so I feel like we're connected. <laughs> <laughs> and it also comes with an exclusive enamel pin that was designed to fit the book. And I do have one more book from Illumicrate that they sent me. It actually came in the mail this morning, so it was perfect timing to share in this video. This one also came with its own exclusive enamel pin and came with a little card, which I will read later. I really like the art on the front though, it's very cool. And then it came in this little cute bag. Ooh, Little Thieves by Margaret Owen. This is a really cool cover on the book jacket. And the pages themselves are red, this beautiful black design. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful, kind princess and her wicked maid. One day, the wicked maid stole the princess's face, and with it her name, her betrothed, everything. The princess had to toil away as a servant, while her maid lived like a queen. When the maid was caught, she died for her crimes, and the princess lived happily ever after, or that is how the story has been told. Now it's time for the wicked maid to tell her side of the story. Interesting. I don't think I've heard of this book, actually. Oh, and it was signed by the author, a little signed sticker that you can put in your own book. That's adorable. Also, the signature is super cute. Ooh, I'm so excited for both of these. So these are the two books sent to me by Lumicrate. They are beautiful editions. I have such a soft spot for beautiful hardcovers, especially with fancy pages. They just look so nice. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much to Daphne from Illumicrate for sending these my way. I am very excited to read them, and you should definitely check out Illumicrate if you're looking for a book subscription box, whether you're looking for the full box that comes with all the extra little goodies or just the book and the pin. So super exciting. Definitely go check out Illumicrate. They have some absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous editions. I may or may not have the Madeline Miller set 
of Circe and the Song of Achilles coming my way, and you can bet I am so freaking excited for it. It's so beautiful. And that is it for this video. As for my plans for December, I'm going to try to read a bunch of the books that I've been meaning to read for several months and have been behind on. I'm just going to try to read as much as possible basically. I'm hoping to hit my 125 books in the year goal. We shall see. But I'm also going to try to just have fun and read books I'm excited about because that's the joy of reading, right? Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget, Ana Luisa is having an amazing sale until December 10th. 15% off one piece, 20% off two pieces, and 25% off three pieces. Perfect for holiday gifting. Use the link in the description box or in the pinned comment to shop the Ana Luisa holiday sale now. Thank you so much to Ana Luisa for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much to my patrons for your support. Extra special thanks to our newest patrons. C Bus to Move, Jess, and Banana. Welcome all of you to the squad. We are so excited to have you. And with that, I'm going to get going. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I'll see you really soon in my next one. Bye, friends.